We're speaking with Charles Thompson. T- tell us how this all happened. Um, it began really in March um, when I received the tip off. Uh, as to when and where Michael Jackson would be flying into the UK to announce his London concert. Um, I worked with The Sun on that story. We had the exclusive. That tip-off came from someone in Michael Jackson's camp, and uh, they asked me to leak that story for them to the press because they wanted publicity surrounding the concert announcement. Um, after that, I continued to work on Michael Jackson's story with The Sun. Um, and I was blogging at the same time, but nothing serious. And then when the Evan Chandler suicide was announced in November, I was working on the story with the Sun, um, and they asked me to send them information about the 1993 allegations, which I did. Um, and I advised them of all the myths, the common myths which appear in the popular media and how they should avoid them. And I sourced all of my information from court documents and audiovisual evidence. And I sent that into the Sun. And when I read the story the next day, it completely discarded all of my information and replaced it with incorrect information. And I was so incensed by that that I wrote a blog about it called um, Chandler's Suicide uh, Highlights Media Bias Against Jackson. And I guess some fans found it or something. Uh, posted it on a fan site, and it got multiplied and multiplied. And uh, within about a month, if you type the title into Google, it was producing 1.5 million websites. And uh, and since then, I've just been writing about Michael Jackson uh, for various places since, uh, since my work became popular. Would you mind telling us uh, some of these myths that myths. keep get, okay. getting perpetrated about... Uh, Well, actually, they're lies. They're not myths about uh, Michael Jackson. And he seems to be the one person in all of history that is suffering the greatest character assassination of anyone else. It's a character assassination on a scale that we have never seen before. With regard to the myths about 93, there's three key ones. The first is that Jordan Chandler accused Michael Jackson. That's a myth. Evan Chandler accused Michael Jackson, and Jordan Chandler denied it vehemently for months. Uh, There's a great investigative journalist called Mary Fisher who wrote a piece for GQ magazine in 1994 called Was Michael Jackson Framed? And she uncovered compelling evidence that the only reason Jordan Chandler ever changed his story was because he'd been administered with a drug called sodium amytal. His father was a dentist, and it's thought that he used this drug as, a, uh, as an anesthetic from time to time. And the drug is known to induce false memory syndrome. So Jordan Chandler vehemently denied these accusations until he was administered with this drug, according to Mary Fisher. The, uh, the second myth is that Jordan Chandler accurately describes Michael Jackson's genitals. That's a total fiction uh, at the time, he claimed that Michael Jackson was circumcised, and a police uh, body search concluded that he was not, meaning that Jordan Chandler had changed his story and then gotten the description wrong, which pretty much undermined everything that he had to say on the, on the matter. You know, you had a, a witness who was a proven liar. You know, he's a proven liar because either he was molested or he wasn't, and he's told both stories. One of them has to be a liar. You know, so you have an inherently untrustworthy witness. Um, so the the description was inaccurate, that, and it's widely reported to this day. It's constantly alluded to as having been correct. It was not correct. It was inaccurate. And the autopsy, which leaked a couple of months ago, again reiterated that Michael Jackson was not circumcised, whilst Geordie Chandler claimed that he was. The uh, the third myth is that Michael Jackson somehow bought his way out of a trial with a settlement. Um, he was never he was never going to stand trial in the first place. People often point to the settlement as the reason that Michael Jackson never stood trial. They neglect to mention that Michael Jackson was under investigation for over half a year before that settlement was ever reached. And with six months of investigation, the police never even had enough 
evidence to arrest him, let alone charge him with a crime. Thomas Snedden, the DA in the case, took his case to three separate grand juries. And all of those grand juries refused to allow him to bring charges because his evidence was so feeble. So the media often points to this settlement as saying, oh, Jackson settled because otherwise he would have gone to prison, or Jackson settled because otherwise he would have faced trial. Michael Jackson was never going to face trial. When he settled with the Chandler family, he was not being prosecuted. He was being sued. And by settling with the family, he saved untold amounts of money. That civil suit could have dragged on for years. And not only cost him millions upon millions upon millions in legal fees, but also earnings. The whole time that case was dragging on, he, would never, he wouldn't have been able to play a concert. He wouldn't have been able to release an album. So those are the three myths that Jordan Chandler was the one who initiated the allegations, that Jordan Chandler accurately described Jackson's genitals, and that Michael Jackson avoided a trial by paying a settlement. And those three myths alone are enough to make him look guilty when they're inaccurately reported. Why do you think that the media persists in this character assassination? What is going on? I think that there's so many factors and it's difficult to pinpoint what the primary ones are. Um, I do think that a big part of it is pride. I think that um, when the 1993 allegations hit, Michael Jackson was typically silent. For much of his adult career, he would not speak to the media. And after 1993, it was no exception. He gave like a four minute speech on television and that was it. And, um, so consequently, all of the information that the media was receiving was coming from the prosecution, either officially or unofficially. So it's, it's questionable how much of it was reliable, how much of it was accurate. And at the time, it's easy to see how they would have been led to believe that Jackson was guilty because they were only getting one side of the story, and it was quite skewed. I think that as the information started to trickle out, okay, it wasn't actually the boy that made the allegations, it was his dad okay, he's on tape threatening to extort Michael Jackson out of millions of dollars. Okay, the boy's got the description wrong. It became increasingly apparent that Jackson was actually not guilty. But the media seems to have already taken this stance that he was. And there's almost an element of um, pride about it. You know, like they're, they're completely unwilling to admit that they got it wrong. And I think that's one of the primary factors. Do you think race plays a, a- has a place here? I think... I often compare the Jackson case to the case of Jack Johnson, which occurred uh, in the early years of the 1900s, and Michael Jackson's trial occurred in the early years of the noughties. Um, and Jack Johnson's... Jack Johnson's media treatment was undeniably racist, and Michael Jackson's media treatment has been undeniably similar. That's the way I always phrase it. I can't say for sure. You know, no journalist has ever come to me and said, oh, hi, you know, I just wanted to tell you that I'm really mean to Michael Jackson because he's black. That's never happened. But, you know, Jack Johnson's treatment was undeniably racist, and Michael Jackson's was undeniably similar. It's like a leeching. You know, I don't know if you know the story of Jack Johnson. Some people probably won't. He was the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world and he won the title in around 1907 or 1908 and he was treated horrendously because the media and the establishment couldn't they couldn't accept the idea of a, a, a black icon a black champion and he was assassinated by the media in almost a blow for blow identical way to michael jackson right down to two separate allegations of sexual misconduct, the first resulting in a settlement, the second resulting in a trial. He was just, he was treated horrendously. They called him names like, um, well, a lot of racist names that I don't really want to say on the radio, but they also called him Jackie. They used to call him Little Jackie, like a kid, you know, rather than an adult. And I always think you skip forward a hundred years and Jackie has just become Jacko. All that's changed in a hundred years is a syllable. You know, I, I do think that there's an argument to be made that race played a part. You have to consider the circumstances as well. You know, Jack Johnson was 
a black champion, you know, 50 years before segregation was listed. Uh, Michael Jackson was a black man who owned the Beatles and outsold Elvis in an era when MTV still wouldn't even put African Americans on its TV channel. So he was a racial trailblazer. He was a pioneer in that field. And I think it would be short-sighted to state for certain that race didn't play a factor. Well, let's fast forward to the trial that um, happened uh, with the Arvizo family. And can you just put out some of those facts for us? Oh, boy. That that whole trial was, um, was you know, it would have been hilarious if it wasn't so tragic. I mean, it was just, it was a farce. The whole thing was a farce. You know, the boy kept changing his story. He went to the police. He said he'd been molested five or six times, then he said it one or two times, you know, who can't tell the difference between being molested one and six times? That's ridiculous. You know, you have uh, the fact that they had all uh, been complicit in uh, false allegations of sexual molestation in the past. There was evidence that they, uh, the children had been coached to lie on the stand in the past. They had lied for financial gain in the past. They were a family of grifters. They uh, concocted these allegations that they were molested by J.C. Penney security staff and extorted a massive amount of money out of J.C. Penney. Uh, you know, the mother took the, I mean, the mother took the stand and uh, and declared that the, uh, you know the Germans. She just kept referring to the Germans. This non-specific of oh, the Germans did it. She kept uh, claiming that Michael Jackson and the Germans were going to abduct her children and fly them to Africa in a hot air balloon or something. The woman was just raving bonkers. The whole case didn't add up. The prosecution kept calling witnesses to testify for them, who would have nothing interesting to say. Uh, quite, you know, quite notably, they called what they what they referred to as five former victims of Michael Jackson. Three of them took the stand and said, he never touched me and I resent the implication. One of them took the stand and said, once Michael Jackson was tickling him and extremely briefly brushed against his crotch, which could easily have been accidental, and the fifth didn't even show up. The fifth was Jordan Chandler, who uh, he, by this point, had gained legal emancipation from his parents. His mother took the stand and testified that she hadn't heard from him in 11 years. And... Uh, uh, he was. Uh, he he actually left the country. Tom Snedden wanted him to testify against Michael Jackson, but Jordan Chandler left the country rather than do that. Um, and had he taken the stand, Thomas Mesero, Michael Jackson's lawyer, had several witnesses lined up who were prepared to testify that in recent years Jordan Chandler had insisted that Jackson never touched him, and that he hated his parents for making him say that he had. And that was why he gained legal emancipation. So even these five former victims turned out to be a completely farcical move on behalf of the prosecution. Then you had this uh, this hilarious conspiracy charge where they uh, they tried to prove that Michael Jackson had tried to kidnap the boy. You know, they they claimed that he'd held the boy and his family captive at Neverland, even though logs showed that the family had been entering and exiting Neverland of their own of their own accord all the time. They'd been making phone calls to whoever they wanted. The whole thing, it just didn't make sense. All of these charges, they had no evidence whatsoever to support any of their charges, and they were caught trying to plant evidence, which is often brushed over by the media. During um, the grand jury testimony before the trial, uh, Thomas Snedden brought out some girly magazines that they found at Michael Jackson's house. And they were not wrapped up in anything. They were not in plastic bags. They were not in evidence bags. And he handed them the kids on the stand and said, is this the magazine that you saw at Jackson's house? You know, do you remember seeing this magazine? And then he took those magazines after he'd handed them to the kids on the stand. And he sent them for fingerprint analysis. And they found the kids' fingerprints on them, which, of course, they would, because they'd just handled them in court. But he tried to brush over that. That evidence was not admitted in the end because it was realized that the fingerprints had been put on the magazines afterwards. But he actually, he took those magazines and he gave them to the kids on the stand 
and then he sent them off for fingerprint analysis to see if their kids' fingerprints were on them, you know, which is a blatant example of the prosecution trying to plant evidence against Michael Jackson. That is how feeble their case was. And it's quite interesting to note that there were over 2,000 so-called journalists covering the trial. It was a circus outside the courtroom, yet day by day they would not report what actually went went on in the courtroom. You want to yeah, talk about well, that? Well, you know, if, if, you know, if even just hearing that number, you know, 2,000 journalists, that courtroom did not hold 2,000 journalists. The courtroom would barely have held 100 journalists, because that's, that's the size of a courtroom. A courtroom is not designed to hold many people. So you have 2,000 journalists stood outside the courtroom reporting on this trial, and only 100 of them, if that, have actually been inside. You know, that's the level of reporting that you had about this trial. Thomas Mesero was dismayed. He was completely dismayed. He would go home at the end of the day, he said, in a couple of interviews afterwards, having had a really successful day in court. And he would switch on court TV, and there would be a panel of supposed experts who were not even inside the courtroom uh, giving their analysis, giving their comments, you know, making these allegations about the, about the, the day in court that they had not even witnessed, they had not even been there. You know, the trial... The trial was poorly covered for that reason. It was, um, you know, you have 2,000 journalists vying for seats inside a courtroom that probably holds about 100 people at the top. And that, that is why the reporting on the trial was so poor. And it's also why Aphrodite Jones's book is so good, because she was actually given a seat, a permanent seat for every day of the trial. Her book, Michael Jackson Conspiracy, kind of reveals the... Uh, the side of the trial that we were never told about. The positive days, which, when we read about them, were turned into negative days. The positive, the positive testimony that, by the time they reached us, was uh, was turned into negative testimony. She gives uh, she gives you the facts. She tells you in her book what really happened inside the courtroom, and the fact that she was actually inside plays a big part in that. You know, it's just absurd. It's absurd to have these two thousand journalists claiming that they're covering a trial when they're not even inside the courtroom. What are they even doing? They're standing around outside the courtroom. It's just absurd. And in fact, she had a uh, change of conscience. She started out being one of those uh, accusers and um, had an epiphany experience um, realizing he wasn't guilty. And um, you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, I I actually interviewed Aphrodite Jones back when her book came out. That was in 2008, and I wrote a piece about it. Um, And she told me that she had... The reason she had presumed Jackson was guilty was because she arrived at the trial late. She arrived a couple of days late because she'd been off covering another big trial, the Scott Peterson trial or something. And so when she got there, she asked, the rest of the press to kind of, you know, what's been going on, can you bring me up to date? And they were all kind of laboring under this illusion that Jackson was obviously guilty because of the 93 settlement. They all all walked into the trial wanting Jackson to be guilty and believing that he was guilty. And so they allowed that to skew their reporting on the trial. You know, if you watch the trial through those eyes, then you will pick out the little sound bites that you think support that theory. You know, it's, it's kind of natural, I suppose. It's, it's just the way your brain works. Um, and then her moment of epiphany actually came on verdict day. Uh, the verdict had been read, and she was live on Fox News via a satellite link. And Bill O'Reilly asked her, do you think they made the right decision? And in that moment, she said she thought about it, and she just thought about the evidence and the testimony, and she said, well, Bill, I have to say yes, I think they did. And in that moment, she completely reevaluated her stance on the Jackson trial. And, um, and that's when she went off and started researching her book, which is very good. I really do recommend it, Michael Jackson Conspiracy by Aphrodite Jones. And it's interesting to note also that um, when all those uh, not guilty verdicts came in, they were never examined by those 2,000 so-called journalists. Why 
did these not guilty verdicts come in? It just uh, just went on to the next thing. It, it wasn't even looked at. Yeah, that that is true. The, uh, and the reason for that is because the media was slightly humiliated by the verdict because they had been making this concerted effort for the past four months or something. You know, the trial was about four months long. They've been making this concerted effort to try to portray Jackson as guilty, you know, twisting the testimony, uh, picking out tiny sound bites which misrepresent the testimony. Uh, you know, this kind of... Um, if Jackson had a good day in court, if Jackson had a bad day in court, for instance, uh, so if a prosecution witness and Tom Snedden or Ron Vernon is is interviewing them, then what what that is essentially that's just a chance for the prosecution to get their witness to make their allegation. You know, that's just a chance for the boy to come on the stand and and make all these graphic allegations. And of course, that gets run as a double a double page spread in most newspapers. You know. Uh, you know, he slid his hand down my pants, he says, boy, or whatever. And, you know, you get all these graphic descriptions and pictures, you know, drawings of the witness looking all sympathetic. And then the next day, Thomas Mesero will take, uh, you know, take the floor and destroy that witness, you know, catch him out in lies, prove that he's lied in the past, prove that he's lied about sexual molestation in the past, pick up the grand jury testimony and say, well, yesterday you said this, but in the grand jury testimony, you said that. Yesterday, you said this, but in the police interview, you said that. He caught him out in lie after lie after lie, including big lies. You know, lies about, he said that Michael Jackson had told him um, that, that all boys have to masturbate because otherwise they'll rape people. And it turned out that Michael Jackson had never said that to him. He admitted on the stand that his grandmother had actually said that to him. Enormous lies, you know, which would in most people's eyes, be the difference between thinking Jackson is innocent or guilty. And then when that happens, the media is kind of embarrassed about the fact that two days, one day or two days previously, they ran this big double-page spread, which kind of portrayed Jackson as guilty. And now, actually, the, uh, the defense team has completely destroyed that witness. And so what they do is, rather than saying, oops, we got it wrong, oops, yesterday's story was a big pile of rubbish, you know, here's the fact. They just go, right, we'll stick that, you know, three paragraphs on page 27 under a Specsavers advert or whatever. They just, they give it comparatively no airtime or no space in the newspaper or the magazine. You know, if they, if they feel, it's a bit like 93, you know, they're not willing to prepare, you know, they're not prepared to admit that they were incorrect. They're not prepared to admit that yesterday's story wasn't actually accurate. It's, um, and so when those verdicts came in, the media was mortified because despite all their efforts, despite, you know, systematically portraying Jackson as guilty, the verdict still came in as they should have done, and the media knew that that's what the verdict should have been all along. And uh, and probably, I imagine as well, they were all geared up for a guilty verdict. They probably had all these packages made up, you know, Jackson in dark lighting with sinister music, you know, and all these pre-recorded VTs. And I imagine that they were so confident that they had successfully skewed the verdict that they didn't even bother to make an alternative for if he was found not guilty. Um, so I think it's uh, a combination of the fact that they were humiliated by the verdict. Uh, and they probably felt, the media as a whole probably felt quite uh, emasculated by the verdict because it, it undermined them because they've been so conservatively trying to portray him as guilty. And also, I think they just weren't prepared for the verdict because they were so confident that they had been successful in skewing the verdict. How much do you do you know how much was spent on the prosecution total? Millions. millions. I don't know the exact amount, but it was millions. Um, you know, Thomas Mesero has famously said repeatedly uh, since the trial that that team of prosecutors, that police force, spent more money and put more resources into trying to convict Michael Jackson than have ever been put into catching any serial killer. You know, uh, they spent atrocious amounts of money on the prosecution of Michael Jackson, right down to setting up hotlines so that supposed victims could call in. You know, after the, uh, after the allegations broke in 2003, they, they set up these hotlines so you could call in and claim that you were molested by Michael Jackson. And they received thousands of calls 
and every single one of them was found to have absolutely no validity whatsoever. In addition to these hotlines, you know, they built a website with Michael Jackson's mugshot on it, almost like a like a prize, you know, like chopping the head off of a lion after you've shot it, you know, and sticking it on the wall. They just they took this mugshot and they kind of mocked him, like setting up this special website with his mugshot on it, like you know, look look what we did to Michael Jackson. Then you have the uh, you have the DA Tom Snedden spending enormous amounts of money just traveling to all different continents looking for victims. You know, this was this was the definition. This was the dictionary definition of a malicious prosecution. You have a prosecutor traveling around the world looking for victims of Michael Jackson. That's how obsessed he was. You know, if not okay, somebody's come to us and they've made a legitimate allegation, so we're going to try it. It's, let's travel halfway around the world looking for someone, anyone, who's going to say something nasty about Michael Jackson. They spent, I, it was millions, I can't remember exactly how much, although I imagine it was very profitable all overall for the community. You have, you know, like you said earlier, 2,000 journalists, plus their cameramen, plus their drivers, you know, plus their assistants, plus their makeup artists and their hairdressers and their, you know, sound technicians. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people coming to Santa Barbara uh, for months on end, you know, staying in hotels, hiring parking spaces, hiring satellite van spaces, buying food, going out to the nightclubs and the bars. So although they did spend, although the prosecution spent a phenomenal amount of money trying to pin something on Michael Jackson. They also, uh, for the community, made a hell of a lot of money uh, because it attracted so many people to the area for so long. And Aphrodite Jones, when it came time for her to uh, assemble all this material, uh, she looked at all the court documents um, and she wrote a book, and the publishers would not publish a book a positive book about Michael Jackson, even though she had had how many bestsellers? She'd had, by that point, I think, seven New York Times top ten bestsellers. Uh, She was a very respected true crime writer. And um, when she went to the publishers and she said, look, I've done all this research, I spent six months, she spent six months reading the transcript and writing the book. She put so much research into this book, she had to buy a second computer because she couldn't, uh, her one computer couldn't hold her research and her writing at the same time. That's how much effort and research she put into this book. And although it was completely grounded in fact, you know, it was completely ground, uh, you know, rooted in the, the trial transcript, she went to the courthouse, she photographed, uh, you know, photocopied every page of every trial transcript. She took pictures of all of the evidence. And um, the publishers just weren't interested. They just they just kept telling her, if it's pro Jackson, then we don't want it. But I think more telling than the Aphrodite Jones situation is the Thomas Mesereau situation, Mesereau being Jackson's lawyer. He was actually offered book deals. You know, Aphrodite Jones was out looking for a book deal. Thomas Mesereau was offered book deals by every major publishing company in America. But when he told them that he would not, uh, that he was not a turncoat, when he told them, I will not say that I believe Michael Jackson is guilty, every single publishing company retracted its offer. They were only prepared to give him a book deal if he said something nasty about Michael Jackson. It's just astounding. It's it's a case for uh, just looking at how mass media operates, and even publishing. When when you look at the books that are available about Michael Jackson out there, many of them are, are smear books, and uh, there, there's not if if you read several of these books, you come to know that they're they're not well written, they're full of inaccuracies and lies. Let's talk about books on Michael Jackson from your point of view, Charles Thompson. Uh, yeah, well, the you know a phenomenal amount has been written about Michael Jackson. You know, huge amount. Um, much of it 
very lazy. You know, in the aftermath of Michael Jackson's death, pretty much every publishing company seemed to be just churning out biographies within about two weeks, you know. And I mean, if you're going to write a biography of someone in two weeks, how good could it be? You know, it just can't, you can't write a good biography. You can't even write a good biography in two months, let alone two weeks. So these books, uh, those books particularly, anything which has come out since Michael Jackson died pretty much is just dribble, you know, just badly researched, rushed dribble, you know. Um, but a lot of what was written before Michael Jackson died was dribble as well. And part of it is because he was so secretive um, and he was so uh, unwilling to speak to the press and to speak to writers that they kind of, I think some of them kind of had it in for him because they felt that it was a slight, you know, you can see it, you can trace it with a finger on a timeline, you know, um, the less Jackson spoke to the press, the more malicious they got, perhaps because they thought, you know, this guy is so famous, why wouldn't he give us a piece of the pie? You know, all it takes is, is three, set, three sentences or something, and we've got, we've got a front page story. Um, but also, I think the fact that he was so quiet for most of his adult career just made it difficult for people to track down the truth. And uh, when you make things difficult for some journalists, they just get lazy. Rather than doing their jobs, rather than doing the difficult research, they just, you know, they just go, oh, I'll just write what I want. You know, I mean, a classic example is Ian Halperin's book. Now, elements of Ian Halperin's book seem to be accurate, but it's just full of these glaring inaccuracies. Stories that were disproved even even before Jackson died, you know, uh, he has these stories in his book, for instance, that um, Michael Jackson didn't show up at rehearsals for the This Is It concert. And now we have the This Is It film, which clearly shows that he did. You know, he has stories in his book that Jackson couldn't sing anymore and couldn't dance anymore. We see in This Is It that he could. He had a story in his book that Michael Jack he claimed he'd seen Michael Jackson's contract and he was only due to be on stage for 15 minutes a night at the O2 concerts or something. Whereas you look at This Is It, and again, you can clearly see that Jackson is rehearsing about 10 songs minimum, you know? So, I mean, he, his book is just riddled with inaccuracies, which were actually disproven before it was even published. And for some reason, they published it with those inaccuracies still in it anyway. That's how lazy the publishing industry is, you know? And, and Ian Halpern is, is uh, paraded out there as a Michael Jackson expert on uh, mass media TV. Yeah, that's, that's quite correct. He is, you know, and like I said, there are elements of his book which are accurate, but most of them, uh, most of the accurate parts of his book and reliable parts are actually just already well-established information which you can read in Randy Tarabarelli's book or Aphrodite Jones's book or Mary Fisher's GQ article. In terms of new material in Ian Halperin's book, in terms of actual journalism, him actually going out and finding information, finding facts, there is just, you know, it's, it's just completely inaccurate. He, you know, you have all these claims about the This Is It concerts, every single one of which is completely disproven by the film, uh, apart perhaps from the, you know, the stories that Jackson was ill uh, which you wouldn't see in the film. But, you know, you can clearly see that Jackson wasn't rehearsing for only 13 minutes. You know, that's that's ludicrous. And you can see that Jackson was at rehearsals because if he wasn't, then there wouldn't be any video of him. You know, these stories, it just amazes me. It baffles me. I ordered his book um, when it came out. I pre-ordered it, and it arrived, you know, on the day that it was due out. And I read it in, in a day uh, because I was hoping that it would be interesting and informative, but really it was just full of rehashed information and completely inaccurate reporting. And it just astounds me that the publishing industry would allow a book like that to go to print. And then it, there wouldn't be stories about the inaccuracies in it. It's... it's um, let's talk about the, the what's happening now in in uh, print journalism and, and journalism on the web, this copy and paste idea where someone will, will s- say some kind of salacious thing and it'll get out there on, on one outlet and then it'll be picked up by... T- tell us tell us 
what you found about that. I did write a piece about that just two weeks ago, I think, for the Huffington Post, um, which is exactly about that, exactly about copy and paste journalism. Uh, at the beginning of February, Gene Simmons of KISS, the band KISS, made a couple of, he made some allegations about Jackson in an interview with Classic Rock magazine, and he said, um, he said that, he said, you know, completely inaccurate, he said Michael Jackson was on tape ordering alcohol for children, which of course he was not. That was, that was never produced in court. Jackson was in court on misdemeanor charges of providing alcohol to a minor. If that tape had ever existed or been played in court, then he would have been found guilty on those charges. You know, there was, um, it just didn't happen. That it just did not happen. I don't know where Gene Simmons got it from. It seems to be a figment of his imagination, but it just didn't happen. He said that at Jackson's trial, a travel agent had taken the stand and testified to flying in boys from Brazil for Jackson's amusement. Again, that is a complete fiction. That, that just did not happen. That testimony was never uh, heard at Jackson's trial. So I don't know what it is. I don't know if he's maybe going senile or if he's just making it up because he thinks it will earn him column inches or something. But it, that just, it, it just did not happen. This didn't happen. And the last comment he made was that he knew a musician on a Jackson tour who had quit because they kept seeing young boys in the hotel, um, you know, uh, which I'll come to in a second. So these comments that he made in Classic Rock go up on Google News. You know, Classic Rock releases it as a trailer for their new issue, and it goes on Google News. So somebody sees it on Google News and goes, oh, that's a salacious story about Michael Jackson. That'll get people clicking onto my website. I'll have that. Copy and paste it. Box. Now it's on two websites on Google News. So it raises up the rankings, which means more people find it which means more people say, oh, that's an interesting story about Michael Jackson, which will get people to come to my website. Copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. Now you've got 10 outlets. You've got 10 outlets reporting this inaccurate story about Michael Jackson. Now it's on the front page of Google News because it's been reported by 10 outlets. So even more people see it and copy and paste it onto their websites. So before you know it, you have these dozens of outlets who are just reproducing these allegations with absolutely no attempt to fact-check them. You know, and it's not difficult. They could contact someone like me. They could contact someone like Aphrodite Jones or Thomas Mesereau who would just say, no, that testimony, it just didn't exist. That just didn't happen. I don't know where you're getting that from. With regard to the comment about um, on the road with Michael Jackson, I easily fact-checked that as well. I went to Jennifer Batten, who was Michael Jackson's guitarist on every single one of his tours. So she toured with him on and off for a decade. You know, whenever Jackson was on the road, she was with him. And I just said, do you have any recollection of anyone quitting a Jackson tour ever? And she said, no. Not only did nobody quit a Jackson tour for that reason, nobody quit a Jackson tour full stop. That's just a complete fiction. I was on every Jackson tour, nobody ever quit. So there you have, you know, that puts, um, that draws a line under all of Gene Simmons' claims. You know, every single thing that he said was proven to be inaccurate. And it was so easy, so easy to disprove. Because all I did was I typed, you know, you go to Google, you type in Michael Jackson tour guitarist, and up comes Jennifer Batten. You click on her website, and there's an email me button. You know, how difficult is that? Why is the media so lazy? You know, you're talking, you're talking 40 seconds on Google and another 30 to write the email. It's just so lazy. It's unbelievably lazy. You know, this copy and paste journalism, I know, I, you know, because of the recession and the rise of the internet, there is less money. You know, there's less money in the news industry. Journalists are being fired, so you've got less journalists trying to fill more space, which means they have less time to spend on their story. But it's just ridiculous. You know, they're not so, they're not so pushed for time that they can't spend 40 seconds on Google and 30 seconds writing an email. Just a fact check. You know, that's the fundamental of journalism. Just fact check. If Gene Simmons says this about Michael Jackson, then don't just print it because you don't know whether it's true. I think the attitude is, oh, well, he said it, not us. But that's not really the point. It's still bad journalism. You know, it was so easy for me to fact check those allegations and disprove them. But rather than doing that, the media just copy-paste, 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 
and all of a sudden it's all over the world. It's in India, it's in Australia, it's in the USA, it's in the UK, it's everywhere. You know, and then, as if to add insult to injury, I tracked down Jennifer Batten, I got that denial from her, I got her to elaborate on that, I gave it to a news outlet and they put it on Google News. And whereas dozens of people picked up the salacious story about Jackson, within two weeks, only four news outlets in the world were carrying Jennifer Batten's retraction, which basically says, you know, the media is willing to publish any baseless but salacious allegation about Michael Jackson, but they're unwilling to print the facts which disprove those allegations. It's just, it's just blatant bias. It's just unbelievable. It's, it's right there in your face. They just make no attempt. It's unashamed. You know, they make no attempt to disguise the fact that they are actively biased against Michael Jackson. And I just find that astounding. Well, you're... Um you wrote a uh, piece for the in the Huffington Post, Michael Jackson, it's time for outlets to take responsibility in covering the rock star. What kind of response did you get to, the, to that? In the media, in terms of media response, um, none. Because, apart from you asking me for this interview, because it just, it, they don't, but it, it, it highlights everything that they're doing wrong. You know, they're not going to call me up. The New York Times is not going to call me up and say, oh, hi, Charlie, could you just write a piece about how we're really biased? You know, or, hi, I saw you gave that, I saw you wrote that piece in the Huffington Post about how crap our journalism is. Can you, can you, you know, give us an interview about it? Because it, it just highlights their shortcomings. Uh, in terms of public response, there are lots of comments underneath the Huffington Post article uh, I would say probably 95% of which are positive. Jackson seems to have uh, this following of obsessive detractors, you know, people who just kind of, you wonder kind of what's gone wrong in their lives, you know, why they've got nothing better to be doing, because they literally just seem to trawl around the Internet typing Michael Jackson into Google, finding the pages with his name on, and then and then writing nasty comments about it, which is quite unbelievable, and then turning turning on anyone who writes anything in his favor as well. But in terms of response, particularly to the, uh, the Huffington Post piece, it has been positive, which I think should just send a message to the media. That, you know, people, because the media, they often use this excuse, we're just giving the people what they want. You know, we're just giving the public what they want. But if the public response to my Huffington Post article is anything to go by, then they're not giving the people what they want because I've got hundreds of people writing underneath it that they're so relieved and so thankful that somebody's writing the truth about Michael Jackson for once, you know. So, yeah, the, the response has been largely, uh, almost overwhelmingly positive. I, I know that uh, there's also a negative reaction to your work, um false claims made about you and and is this from the um these uh fanatics that are are um, out to yeah, point a finger at michael there is um there are a couple of it happens to anyone who takes jackson's side you do have these kind of militantly anti jackson uh you know posters on the internet and uh they try to discredit anyone. I think they find me threatening because a lot of the people who write in Michael Jackson's favor are overtly fans. You know, they they kind of um, obsessive. They use religious language sometimes. You know, they describe him as an angel or whatever. And uh, they find me threatening, I think, because I'm not, I'm not like that. I am a journalist. I'm a credited journalist. You know, I am um, I don't, I don't portray Jackson as a martyr. You know, I, they just, some of them describe me as a flu. I don't know what, I don't know where that words come from. F L double O N, like I'm some kind of crazed fan. But you know, I don't even like all of Jackson's albums. I don't even like all of his tours. You know, I'm not some crazed fan. You know, did I like Off the Wall and Thriller? Yes. Did I have tickets to This Is It? Yes. But did I camp outside his house every day? No, you know, I'm not some kind of crazed fan. I'm just, I'm just a regular person who enjoys some of Jackson's work, you know. Um, and they tried, but they tried to portray me as this 
uh, in their words, swoon, you know, and, um, and uh, there are people who claim that I don't exist. They claim that I'm some kind of composite, compo you know, created by the fans, you know, as a front for them. There are people who claim that I am, uh, I am actually a writer called Deborah French. There is a, there's another British writer called Deborah French who covers the same territory as me sometimes. And um, these people, they claim baselessly that Deborah and I are the same person. <laughs> I've, uh, I've spoken to Deborah. I've spoken to her on the phone. She definitely exists, so she's definitely not me, you know. Um, so it, it amazes me because they, what they did, they tried to discredit my research, uh, although all of my research pretty much is sourced directly from official documents, whether it be FBI files, trial transcripts, grand jury testimony, you know, police documents or whatever. Um, and if I don't source it from there, then I source it from reliable books like J. Randy Terabarelli's uh, Michael Jackson biography, and uh, so on the one hand they're trying to trying to claim that my research is is poor, and on the other hand they're claiming without any evidential basis, you know, with no basis in reality, that I don't even exist, or they're claiming with no evidential basis that I am the same person as Deborah French, or they're claiming, you know, whatever. It's just like they're claiming that I'm some kind of deranged fan, you know. They have no evidential basis for any of these statements. It, it just amazes me how how desperate they are to discredit anyone who says anything pro Jackson. I think a lot of the I think a lot of that is racially motivated. A lot of it is um, I, I just I can't really tell you where it comes from, but there just do seem to be this relatively small amount of Jackson detractors who put themselves all over the internet trying to discredit anything pro-Jackson. You know, I don't quite understand what their motivation would be or, you know, what went so tragically wrong in their lives that they've got nothing better to be doing with their time. But they, you know, they just seem to be militant, militant and obsessive. They call Jackson fans obsessive. And yet they, they are the ones typing his name into Google every day and spamming all of his websites with nasty messages. You know, how obsessive is that? Uh... So I, I really don't take much notice of them, to be honest. They, I don't engage with them. Uh, I'm lucky enough that they haven't started emailing me or anything. You know, they've uh, they've kept it all on websites like Topics. Um, I would prefer that they weren't out there making these stupid claims. You know, that I don't exist and stuff because that's not that's not very good for me. You know, <laughs> in terms of. Um, getting work, getting business, if people type my name into Google and the first thing they find is that I don't exist. But, um, well, we're, you know, we're speaking with uh, soul funk music specialist Charles Thompson, a, um, a real journalist uh, who's uh, based in England. And I know that you're, you're somewhat of an authority on James Brown. And, and um, last week there came out a, a story that his body was stolen. Did, what do you know about that? Yeah, I, I have to say, I was up working quite late on, um, I think it was on Thursday night. I was up, it was about 3 a.m. in the UK, and I was just about to go to bed, and I, I just clicked on Google News to see what the uh, what the top stories were, and I almost jumped out of my chair because there was a story on the Daily Mail website that James Brown's body had been snatched, you know, stolen from its tomb, and... Um, you know, I can't claim to have been a friend of James Brown's, but I did meet him, I did exchange words with him, I did see him live several times, and I've done a lot of work on him since he passed away. And I do know people who were close to him, I know people that saw him on a daily basis, I know people that worked with him, toured with him, and I was thinking also how they were going to react to this news. It's just the idea of stealing a body anyway, you know, grave robbing, essentially, is so despicable and disturbing, I couldn't believe it. Um... I had to go to bed, and it was, it was a strange time to start calling anyone anyway. But the next day, I did speak to Mr. Brown's son, um, Daryl, Daryl Brown, who was, who was his tour guitarist. And um, he basically said to me, look, this story is not true. It's, the allegations are being made by a lady who is uh, essentially a love child. She came forward after James Brown died, took a DNA test, and it was found that she was more likely his daughter than not. Um, but, you know, she doesn't real, really have any family ties. She's not even been to the crypt. 
So uh, the, the family released a statement later that day. But what you find, if you type it into Google, the media are still, they're still kind of going, oh, you know, there's a, there's a controversy surrounding whether or not James Brown's body has been stolen. His body has not been stolen. You know, there's no controversy. His body has just not been stolen. One kind of, one woman said that it had been, and now the family has authoritatively uh, dismissed that claim. Uh, so, yeah, the, the body has not been stolen. I spoke to Mr. Brown's family in the last couple of days, and the body is where it should be. So another case of um, media lies, inaccuracies. Not necessarily, yeah, not necessarily lies, because this, this, uh, this lady did contact the media under her own volition and tell them that the body was missing. And I suppose they thought she was an authoritative source because she is his daughter, uh, officially. So uh, I can see why they went with the story, because it is a, a truly shocking story, and they seem to have a rock-solid source. But as it turns out, this lady, although she is uh, technically Brown's daughter, she was not um, officially his daughter until after he died. She has no ties to the family. She's not been to the crypt. Um, and they don't quite understand what her motivation is, but they just say, basically, there's no way she could possibly be an authoritative source on whether or not the body's been moved because she's not even been to the crypt. So, officially, you know, the, the body has not been moved, uh, and I just wish the media, the media's real shortcoming is in not not reporting that widely enough, you know, rather than still speculating over whether it's been stolen or not, which I suppose is more interesting. They should just again. I feel sometimes like whenever any, whenever one of these stories comes out about some kind of black icon, you know, it's left to me to deny it. You know, Gene Simmons' comments all around the world. It's left to me to bring up Jennifer Batten and get the denial and put it out there. You know, the story goes around the world about James Brown's body. It's left to me to do the most basic of fact checking. You know, ring up the family and ask if it's true. It's basic fact checking. You know. It just alarms me that the media is so lazy that they won't do this basic fact-checking. I think I was the first person to actually put out a denial by the family. The Augusta Chronicle put out a denial by the, uh, the funeral parlor, but I, I think I was the first person in the world for, to put out a denial by the family and the only person in the world for quite some time as well because the media was just not picking up on it. Charles, thank you so much. I can't believe we've reached 1 a.m., and, and I thank you yeah. so much. People that would like to read your writing, you've got a, a website. Do you want to direct yeah. them to it? Yeah, my website is um, www.charles, that's C-H-A-R-L-E-S, dash Thompson, T-H-O-M-S-O-N, dot net. And to read my Huffington Post piece, you can just type in Charles Thompson Huffington Post, and it will be the first link that comes up. Well, good work. All the best to you. I enjoy all of your writing, and um, may the truth prevail. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you know, like I said, you're the only person in the media so far who has come to me since the Huffington Post piece was published. Um, at all, you know, positive or negative, you're just the only person who's, who's even bothered to contact me. I think the media often sweep this kind of thing under the carpet. Whenever anybody tries to discredit them, they uh, they just act like it isn't happening. You know, if we, if we close our eyes and put our fingers in our ears, then it will just go away. Um, well, thank you, Charles. We have to move on to the next programmer, but um, all the best to you, and thank you so much for the work that you've done. And, okay. Uh, Thank we'll be speaking me. with you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. And um, it's uh, 101. You're tuned to KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley. And-